This is the Bible. Of course, it's the, the book of books, the best book in the world. Uh, so many other books are simply reflecting the light that comes from this uh, being like the, the sun and every other book is just reflecting any other inspired book. Uh, in the Bible, of course, it's divided in two parts. You've got your New Testament that uh, just to give you, that's Matthew. And so three quarters of your Bible is going to be roughly Old Testament. I just, uh, Karen will tell you, I spent a long time looking for a Bible that was nothing but the Bible. And so this one, it's got like no special helps. And the back, when you get to the end, you got a couple maps, and there it is. This is, uh, this is in. I wanted big print, and I wanted a small Bible, so I had to sacrifice something. But um, then in the Old Testament, you, you have a very special segment, which is the Pentateuch. And Pentateuch, Penta means five. So we got Pentecost. It's 50 days after Passover. We got a famous building. I think it's one of the second largest buildings in the world is in North America. It's called the what? Pentagon. A uh, bigger building is actually the, uh, the main house for the president in Romania. It's amazing. I, I was there a couple of years ago with Pastor Ross. But, um, and then at the beginning of the Pentateuch, and it, you know, if you look at some of the ancient Jewish scrolls, they have the Pentateuch as all one roll together. And there's just markings in where it'll say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But it's, they keep the Pentateuch all in one roll. Sometimes it's referred to as the law. They call it the five books of Moses. Uh, Moses probably wrote uh, another book. Most believe he also wrote, who knows, Book of Job. And uh, as far as the timing, many believe that the Book of Job may have been written before even um, the Book of Genesis. Now, the Book of Genesis by the Jews is not called Genesis. It's called uh, Beresith. And I probably pronounced that wrong, which is a shame because I'm Jewish and I should know better. But it simply means the beginnings. It's basically named off of the first few words in the book. Um, we typically call it Genesis, which is the Greek title for the book from the Septuagint. Now you'll often hear me refer to the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a very important piece of Hebrew literature um, because Alexander the Great spread the Greek culture so many places. Uh, they wanted to eventually get a Greek copy of the Hebrew scriptures and so there were, they say the 70 elders were technically 72 elders that uh, translated uh, the books, not every book in the Old Testament, some of it was done later, but the five books of Moses and um, there it's called Genesis and that also means the beginning. If we say the Genesis of my story, we mean the beginning of my story. Now Moses probably, first of all, Almost nobody contends who wrote Genesis. You've got people that will argue about who wrote the book of Mark and they'll argue about who wrote the book of Daniel and there's scholars that are, that'll argue about, uh, you know, who wrote uh, Proverbs and a, a number of other things, but virtually nobody in history argues about the authorship of Genesis because as far back as you can go, everybody attributes the book to Moses. Um, Jesus, if you're going to believe Jesus, he attributes the book to Moses. Matter of fact, uh, one way we know this is a very important book, there are over 200 times in the New Testament when Genesis is referenced. Genesis is the most quoted book in the New Testament of the Old Testament scriptures. So it's extremely important that we, uh, we have an understanding. Probably he wrote the book, uh, Moses lived about 1500 years before Jesus. It's believed that he wrote the book while he was in the wilderness. Uh, before the Exodus. Uh, and one way, well, let me read something to you from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, and this is page 251. This is that classic that explains the early foundations of history. Speaking of Moses' time in the wilderness, as the years rolled on, he wandered with his flocks in solitary places, pondering upon the oppressed condition of his people. He recounted the dealings of God with his fathers, and his promises were the heritage of the chosen nation. And his prayers for Israel ascended by day and by night. Heavenly angels shed their light around him. Here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis. The long years spent amid the desert solitudes were rich in blessing, not alone to Moses and his people, but to the world and all succeeding ages. 
Now, prior to the time of Moses, you know, the original or the origin of the Hebrew scriptures begins with Moses. Um, how did they pass on instruction from God? Before it was codified or written down, it was transmitted orally. Now keep in mind, <laughs> we're living in an increasingly a dumb age. Now I don't mean that as an insulting way, I just mean that uh, we are uh, losing our capacity to recall things because we have so many ways of storing information where people used to depend on their minds. And your memories can be improved. But from birth on, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so uh, they would transmit things orally. Um, there are a few people that live in modern times that have true photographic memories. One person, uh, I did an amazing fact about this lady. They won't give her name out because she just got harassed so much. But uh, she's been the subject of study for years. And she could recount every day in her life what she ate, everything she did, just like a tape in her head. She just rolled it back and she remembered everything. I mean, up to, you know, probably the time she began to understand speech. But it was a phenomenal thing as you'd read the report. Uh, this woman, they call her, you know, subject so-and-so. Um, so some people have true photographic memories. So if a person today, after 6,000 years of the degradation of sin, can have such incredible recall, how do you think the memory of Adam was, or Abraham, who lived 175 years? I think they had phenomenal minds, and when they spoke, their words meant something. And um, are you aware that Adam spoke to Methuselah, Methuselah spoke to Shem, Shem of course lived until after the flood, so you've already got from creation to after the flood with two people. Shem spoke to Abraham, Shem's life overlapped the life of Abraham over a hundred years. Abraham spoke to Isaac, who spoke to Levi, who spoke to Amram, the father of Moses. So you've got seven people from God to Moses that could transmit uh, information. And so when Moses is writing the book of Genesis under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't like he was out there in the desert listening to the goats and the sheep bleeding and all of a sudden this story just popped into his head. The story had been transmitted orally from the fathers to the forefathers. One reason we know this is a number of the stories in Genesis are found among, uh, with some variations and corruptions, many cultures of the world that are separated. The story of the flood, for example. The Hawaiians, who did not descend from the Hebrews, they have a story about a global flood and this man named Noe and his family with some dogs and pigs <laughs> in a canoe <laughs> sailed to the island. It's, it's, you know, and the whole world was flooded because of evil. And so it's a very similar story. Matter of fact, I've read several books where they go through the legends around the world. Some of you have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh and other stories. And so Pandora's box, Greek mythology. This woman opened a box and let all the evil out. Well, that's a pretty wide corruption of something that could be traced to the story of Adam and Eve. Atlantis, these brilliant people who lived a long time, who had great technology because of their wickedness, the gods punished them and the island was swallowed up in the ocean. That's where the Atlantic Ocean gets its name. Something like the flood story. So many of the stories in Genesis can be found in other parts of the world. So Moses, when he's writing this down, it didn't pop into his mind as something that he had never heard before. It had been transmitted orally. I'm sure Jethro, his father-in-law, who was a monotheistic uh, believer in Jehovah, they would sit around the fire and recount the sacred stories. And that could be part of where uh, some of Job came from. Anyway, so that gives you just a little bit. Um, Genesis has a genealogy. Now the book of Genesis is really divided into two parts. The first 11 chapters are dealing with the creation and the entrance of man and it establishes just a, a lot of fundamentals. Then from chapter 11 on you've got God calling a people and is dealing with those people. So up until the Tower of Babel it's talking about man in general 
and then from the time of Babylon it begins with God's call of Noah and the rest of the Bible, I'm sorry, God's call of Abraham, the rest of the Bible is an expansion of what God is doing in the world through this people that he called. Uh, the book of Genesis you really have the foundation of so many teachings. It's in Genesis you've got foundation for marriage, you got the foundation for where evil came from, you got the foundation for creation, um, the death, why there is sin, diet, clothing, marriage, language, fear, uh, just so many things that are part and parcel of life are first introduced in the book of Genesis. And so uh, <clears throat> you cannot, uh, if you're going to be a Bible believer, you can't not believe that part of Genesis is inspired and part of it is mythological or fables. There are uh, probably well-meaning people, but I believe they're very wrong that to say, yeah, they believe in the inspiration of the Bible, but you cannot take the first 11 chapters of Genesis seriously. These were ancient legends designed to teach a story. God did not speak man into existence. They believe in what they call theistic evolution. Uh, they believe the story of Noah is a moral story that, you know, the whole world wasn't flooded. It was a local flood. And, and they just, they play down so many of the big stories and the story of Tower of Babel and, and um, even Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, of course, much later. They say, oh, these were fables. They never really happened. But you cannot say that and say you believe the rest of the Bible because you really have to say, I don't believe Jesus. Because Jesus said in John 5, 46 and 47, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not, do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, is that clear enough? If you don't believe in what Moses wrote or you start to write it off, pardon the pun, yeah, you start to dismiss it, then you don't really believe Jesus because Jesus referenced the writings of Moses. Jesus referenced Genesis, the first 11 chapters, six times, always as a fact. He says, in the beginning he made them male and female. Luke 16, verse 31, Jesus again speaking, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one should rise from the dead. Again, the words of Jesus. So Genesis is foundational. And when Christ rose from the dead and he wanted to prove who he was, where did he begin? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Jesus called Moses part of scripture, the things concerning himself. Now that's a very important point. Jesus does not first appear in uh, Matthew where it says the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus first appears in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Because when it says in the beginning God created, now I may not get much further than that verse today, in the beginning God created, you read later, all things that were made were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so all things God made were made through Jesus. And so uh, what about Moses? Where did he get his education? Uh, we could learn a little bit about the author here. Uh, God did something extraordinary for Moses in that he fitted him for, him for his work. Uh, God is not against formal education. Um, was it a bad thing that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to a Babylonian university for three years? The additional learning there, some of it's very practical. You know, they say that... Um, We've got even generations now that under, uh, don't understand the reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> they call it the three R's. <laughs> reading, writing, that's a joke. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> but um, it used to be if you had those fundamentals, you could be a very successful businessman. Um, so even in the Babylonian universities, they learned some sciences that were true. And Daniel's book uh, grew out of his expanded education and his understanding of his, these things. The Bible says in Acts 7.22, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And I'm sure there were some things he had to spit out the seeds and eat the melon. But you can't deny that you look at those pyramids and you know the math and the architecture and uh, some of the organizational ability. Look at what Joseph did in Egypt with his organization. And so they had some knowledge and education that was valuable. God took the good of that Moses had to spend 40 years unlearning the bad and learning more about God in the wilderness and then he could take the best of all 
and um, use it to his advantage. I look back on my life and um, I, I sometimes bemoan, I, a little bit jealous, that, you know, I married somebody who's the antithesis of I am, in, in that Karen went to the same elementary school, high school for 12 years, Christian education for two years, what, Loma Linda and PUC, four years? And uh, she knows people everywhere she went because she was in the same place. I went to like 14 different schools and finished the ninth grade. But you know what? I think back and I think the Lord used that because I went to so many different kinds of schools. I met so many different kinds of people from public school to Jewish school to, um, I was telling Karen, I just discovered this week, my mother sent me to a camp. I was looking up the camp because I'm writing a book, Camp Songo, and it said it was a Jewish camp. And then Camp Mendota, another Jewish camp. I said, I didn't even know they were Jewish camps. My mother sent me these Jewish camps. But um, so I think the exposure, you look back and think, God can take those things and then use them for good later. So even the things he learned there in Egypt for 40 years, I think God was able to later use. Uh, Ezra was educated in Babylon. Paul was educated in Greece and Rome. And uh, John Bunyan and many others, you know, the Lord used these times of even isolation to um, uh, pass things on. All right. I may say more about the introduction to the book. I was reading introductions in preparation for, day, for today, and I realized I could go six weeks on introducing Genesis. It, and I read some pretty profound things. But we'll never get into it. In the beginning, all right. So we, tell, we find out right away the context. Genesis is taking us back to the beginning. Not the beginning of the beginning, but the beginning of all beginnings. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, uh, it answers the most important questions here about atheism, pantheism, polytheism, materialism, dualism, evolutionism and humanism because just by making that one statement it sweeps every other ism aside when it says in the beginning God created. It's coming from the thought of God. You look in Proverbs 8.22 The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. I've been established from everlasting from the beginning before there ever was an earth. When there was no depths I was brought forth He's talking about wisdom here. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. And you read in Psalm 90, it says, From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. It says, While yet he had not made the earth of the fields or the primeval dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so the water should not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, I was beside him as a master craftsman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. It's talking about the wisdom of God that created all things here. Now, who did the creating? Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 For by Him, Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. Now, there's a belief that kind of comes and goes through history that uh, Jesus um, did not, He's not eternal. That He somehow God, because the Bible says His only begotten Son, that that means there was a time when He was begotten, you know, like He beget, uh, Adam begat His Son as though He were born. And uh, some of the people that um, support this, they, they argue, say, no, it's not the same as being born, He was begotten. Well, I say, well, you th think Jesus was created. No, He wasn't created, He was begotten. He says, I've had this discussion with a few people. I said, are you telling me there was a time He was not? Yes. And then He was? Yes. By the virtue of God? Yes. Then he was created. If God brought him forth, he was created. Then he is no longer creator, he is a creature. And it is no longer true that all things were created by him 
because otherwise it would say all things except himself. But it says all things were made by him. And then, of course, I read to you, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, John 1, verses 1 through 3. And the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All Now, wherever the beginning was, He was there. Isn't that what it says? So you go back as far as you can go. Another reason you need to believe in the eternal nature of the Father and the Son, if you define God in one word, what is that word? God is love. What is love? Except the expression of the ador adoration, the agape, all the different definitions, of the giving of this uh, emotion and feeling and good. How can you be love with nobody to love? Who, who do you love? Because God's love is all about a love that gives away from self. The devil is all about taking only and not giving. So the idea that there could be a time when God existed as love and there wasn't a son or a spirit, he's no longer love. Does this see what I'm saying? So from everlasting to everlasting, Jesus had to exist. Um, and when it says God, it's using the word Elohim there. Later in chapter 1, you're going to discover, it says God says, let us make man in our image. Even in far as Genesis 11, it'll say, the man has become like us. And so that is a plural form of God that's used there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, before I go much further, um, you can look in Psalm 93, verse 2. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Exodus, Moses says to God, Who are you? And how does God answer? What's your name? I am that I am. What does he mean by that? I remember when I was searching through different religions for a while, I got into some Eastern religions and I was on this boat and I was reading a book, Bhagavad Gita, and uh, dealing with transcendental meditation and other things and they, they all talked about I am and they were telling me that I am that I am. That God is in me, I am. And then later I read that in the Bible and said, no, that's very different. God is saying, you are not, I am. <laughs> You're not the self-existent one. And you know what I struggled with? Can, the Eastern religions were saying, you are God. And I was thinking, well, even if I was a very dumb God, I should be smart enough to know it. No one else would have to tell me, do you know you're God? You've got to be a pretty ignorant God if you don't even know it. Right? A and so, um, no, God says, I am that I am. He is the self-existent one. Is that right? Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and for how long? Forever. He's existed forever. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the beginning and last letters in the Greek alphabet. He's, of course, the embodiment of the Word of God that is made up from all those letters. The beginning and the end, says the Lord. As far as you can go in one direction, as far as you can go. Do you know, if you say, I'm going to go north, you can reach a point where you can't go north anymore. You reach the end of north. And if you say, I'm going to go to the south, you can reach the end. You, if you take your compass all the way to the south pole, it's just going to start going haywire. But if you say, I'm going east, you can never stop going east. Or if you say, I'm going west, you can never stop going west. It's eternal. And Jesus has no beginning or no end. He is from everlasting to everlasting. So um, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created bara. And this word um, does not preclude the use of the word pretext or material. God doesn't need material. Now, I'm going to take a little time because this is a great time to do it and talk about how important it is to believe that God created and how different it is from what we're talking about in the world today. When you talk about the beginnings, in the beginning, the book of Genesis means beginning. God created. And it says the heavens and the earth. That means everything that you can observe looking up and everything you can observe looking down. Everything there is. By man's observation, he created it all. Now, you read later in the Bible that he made everything that is. All things are made by him. Um, what did God need to make it? So, let's, let's, let's wind back to the beginning. Let's assume that you exist right now. How many of you believe you exist? How do you know that everyone else isn't just a figment of your imagination? And then you're on the universe alone. But you could just be imagining that you're touching them. And <laughs> I went through all kinds of these philosophical crazy ideas. And, um, 
But let's assume that there is a reality that you not only exist, but others exist, that we're here, that you're breathing, you're alive, you're self-conscious, you're self-aware. Uh, where did we come from? Where did the world come from? Is there a purpose? You have to start asking those questions. Why do I exist? Is there a reason? There's two very different theories that are spreading around the world. Uh, one is God and the other is nothing. One theory says that nothing made everything. You've heard of the Big Bang? I, I remember I went to a, a science teacher when I was in military school in uh, New York. He was actually a believer. And I was an atheist, and so I was arguing with this believer science teacher. And uh, we had a discussion that sounded something like this, well, where did everything come from? And, and I said, well, the, you know, the Earth was formed when the... Um, our solar system exploded and, you know, the sun sent these planets spiraling off into space. And where'd the sun came from? It came from uh, when the galaxy was formed. There was a big explosion and, you know, sent all the galaxies spiraling, our solar system spiraling out. And where was that formed? Well, the cosmos was formed during the Big Bang. What caused the Big Bang? And there were varying theories. I remember when I was young, the theory was these gas masses collided and they went bang. And um, now they say that all of the universe, you've maybe heard this one, uh, the Big Bang, uh, it all began with a material that was so dense that it could fit on the head of a pin. Have you heard that one? Um, boy, I tell you, that talk about something coming from nothing. So I, I say, all right. Where did that material come from? You, you say it's only as big as the head of the pin, but where did it come from? And why did it wait so long to explode? What made it? What was the cause? There has to be a cause. See, the, you, you're talking about the result. What's the cause? And they can't give you a cause. And where did it come from? They can't give you an answer. And I say, all right, so you're going to think all the order and organization and design and sym symbiotic relationships and symmetry that we see throughout the observable world and universe all came from chaotic explosion of something as big as the head of a pin. Now where do we see anything like that happening? Where you get an explosion that produces order and design and interworking functions. You don't see that anywhere. You can't observe that. You can't ever prove it scientifically. Everything that we see in nature deteriorates. Everything from, you know, you get clothes, and eventually they get a rip in them. The, uh, an intelligence and design goes into weaving the cloth and putting it in a loom and dyeing the cloth and sewing the cloth and designing the, the pants and you put them on and eventually they start to fade and tear. Now, of course, people tear them on purpose ahead of time. So you get, they get pre and you have to pay more for the atrophy of your pants. <laughs> but after a few years, even as good as jeans are, and you can recycle them through a few people if you're careful. When I was a kid, we used to iron patches on them. Um, everything breaks down. Your car breaks down. Everything that you buy is expected to have a lifespan. It breaks down. You're going to break down. Some of you feel it already, <laughs> and I do. So, but uh, without, the, without the infusion of energy, intelligent energy, you don't get organized creations. So evolution is in my opinion, and I used to believe it, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I think when you really think through it, the idea that you get order and design from chaos cannot be seen anywhere. Uh, it is a, a crazy idea. What's behind it? Because if in the beginning there was nothing, and we all came from nothing, and we exist for no purpose, then you can live however you want because it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks and nobody will make you accountable, and you don't have to answer to God after your life. And if everything came from nothing and there is no purpose, then there's no accountability. That is at the foundation of people, most people. Some are raised in atheism, and they, they just don't know any better. But otherwise, I think thinking people are fighting against the idea that there's an intelligent God because that then means they must give an account someday for the life they live. They don't like the purpose of their life. They want to define their own life. They want to be their own God. What does Genesis tell us in the very beginning? The devil said, you will be as God. And so um, 
I think it's so important to un understand that. I think it was Vladimir Lenin that said, uh, if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes truth. How many of you know people that if you tell them that you don't believe in evolution, they look at you like you just crawled out of a hole somewhere? Like, whoa. I remember my dad and I having a conversation driving in the car. He said, you don't believe in evolution? I said, no. I said, Dad, I think it's the most absurd thing in the world. He said, how can all those scientists, you think you're smarter than all those scientists? Have you heard that? They got all this research. It's been proven. Now, there's a lot of people that say they know about conspiracy theories, and I don't believe in most of the goofy conspiracy theories. I won't even mention some of them right now because some of you may believe them. But there's a lot of really crazy conspiracy theories out there. But there's one that I believe. I believe that there is a conspiracy among some of the educators of the world to stifle the truth and the evidence that things are not as old as they pretend they are. Now, the whole evolution theory implodes like a, a house of cards except for their, their dating. It's all built on their dating. Because you don't find any of the missing links or the interspecies. You don't find anything going from dolphin to chicken. And you don't find anything going from cat to dog. The Bible says they're all made after their kind. And we'll, we'll get to those verses a little later. Uh, you can, you can, you know, you can breed all kinds of cats. A house cat, in theory, can be bred with a mountain lion. You, you, and a bobcat. You probably heard of bobcats getting close to the house cats. Yeah, it, yeah and they get the chickens too. But uh, you don't have a cross between a crocodile and a uh, an aardvark. I mean, they're just the the. And, and why would there be such? a unique variety in the same environment if they all evolved under the same circumstances. Evolution presupposes that because the different animals have things in common, that one came from the other. They think, well look, you know, we got hands and thumbs something like an ape and we got feet like an ape and there's uh, some similarities and if they try real hard and you train them in a circus they can stand up and walk on two feet for a little while. And uh, you can put clothes on them and try and make them do human things. You can make a parakeet talk and you can make a seal clap, but they're not people. Um, humans are so vastly different than any other creature. The idea that we evolved from chimpanzees, they say, oh, well, we share so much DNA with chimpanzees. Well, we share DNA with ants. I mean, y you know, so th that's, that is a, a straw man argument that they say. Why do we have things in common? All right. In the world today, there are dozens of different automobile and motorcycle manufacturers. Got Toyota, Honda, Subaru, Mazda, Nissan. That's just Japan. And you got uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes in Germany. You got them in Italy. You've got them in Russia. Um, they're getting better. I remember when, uh, what do they call those cars? The, the Vlada or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. I've got Russian friends that are watching. I apologize. Uh, used to have a Yugo. They didn't last very long. You got all these cars. Now, you know what you can say about all these cars? They almost all have rubber tires. They got windshield wipers. They got an electric system. They got a lubrication system. They got a steering wheel. They got lights. I could go on and on of things they have in common. And they were made in entirely different factories by different designers. Why do they have all of these things in common? Because they work in the same environment and those are the best things to have. Why do we have so many things? Why do we have feet in common with other creatures? Because you've got to move around. Why? And, you know, some millipedes have got a thousand feet. Some animals got four feet. Bugs have got six feet. We got two, or bipeds. Uh, just because we have feet and other animals have feet doesn't mean that one slowly evolved from another. Because we operate in an environment with air and light and water, there's things that we have in common. We can share certain food resources. So the idea that all one came from the another, um, there, there's no evidence in observable history of any intermediary links between creatures. So how do you get past that, that blockade? 
You say, well, that's because in order to see these changes, they happen after millions of years. And they figure if they just add enough years, they can say anything could happen after millions and millions of years. That's not true. Eventually things get to where they are mathematical impossibilities. An example. To get the sequence of DNA in your body, or even to produce a simple cell form, it's an incredibly complex arrangement of proteins and electrons and, and uh, neutrons that just to have one cell of life, and let alone how could that first cell of life know how it's supposed to reproduce? That it would suddenly become a living thing and not only become a living thing, it's developed the ability to draw food from its atmosphere and to procreate in its own image. Do you, do you know that would be like giving a monkey a typewriter how long would it take for him to produce an Encyclopedia Britannica? Most of you don't know what an Encyclopedia Britannica is anymore. They used to sell them door to door. You'd buy, we had a Collier's Encyclopedia and it's just like, you know, this big and that's, re now it's called Google and it's, you know, on your phone. But I I anyway, so the Britannica I think was more dependable than the internet. <laughs> but the idea, how long would it take a monkey to produce that with a typewriter? I you think, well, given enough time he could do it. No, he couldn't. It is a mathematical impossibility. More and more thinking scientists are admitting that the idea of life on the planet happening without an outside intelligent source is impossible. So you know what they're coming up with now? They're coming up with the idea that our planet was seeded from another intelligence outside. Now th that, that's a very sneaky theory. The reason for that theory is um, now it takes the problem of creation and it puts it on another world you and I can't see or find or talk to so we can't investigate it. And they say, well yeah, it's another intelligent species out there introduced life into our planet. And they got all kinds of stories and movies and things that are saying that now because they realize for it to happen on its own on our planet uh, it would be impossible. You can't have a warm puddle of water for billions of years and suddenly things are swimming through it and thinking and anyway so some of the other things that I just talked about the complexity of life um, the symbiotic relationships that you find you know in our backyard now we put up a hummingbird f feeder and and uh, I've almost made it a shrine I just love looking out there and watching little hummingbirds Karen's I said look another one another one and she's getting tired of me saying it and, and uh, but she's helped me feed them now. But you know, so there are some flowers that cannot survive without certain hummingbirds, and certain hummingbirds cannot survive without those flowers. And there are trees that can never live without bees pollinating them. Not that there's millions of flowers. Einstein said, if all the bees of the world should die, the world wouldn't last much longer. Um, you think about what in nature would require a flower and a bee to evolve. So you've got this one creature that has to be able to fly and gather the pollen of another creature and share it. It would get what it needs from the flower and the flower gets what it needs from the bee. There's no scenario or scheme that you can devise where those things would happen on their own without some kind of intelligent input. And you see it all through history. I mean even in your digestive system you've got friendly bacteria. Now doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? friendly bacteria. <laughs> it's kind of like military intelligence. <laughs> you know, things usually don't go together, right? <laughs> or woman driver. There's all kinds of... <laughs> I just did that to wake you up. That's all. I wasn't making a statement. I just did that to wake you up. <laughs> I knew that would elicit a response. Oxymorons. I talked a little bit about the law of entropy, that we do see observable laws in the universe and one of those laws is that things break down. If you have a garden that's organized and designed, that's got the flowers and the rows and things are flourishing and you pull out the weeds, it's because you've invested intelligence and design and energy into making it a beautiful, organized, symmetrical garden. But then you get sick and you can't do anything with the garden for a year and you come back, what happens to it? It turns back to chaos. It goes to weed. It's like your garden. <laughs> it goes to weed. We've seen it in our garden too. Um, so you, you look in the world and you look in the design of creatures 
And there's so obviously been uh, an intelligent cycle, an ecosystem. You know what I think is so amazing? That a lot of these evolutionists are also environmentalists. They're talking about saving the world so it can heal. And so much of their conversation talks, they sound like we need to, you know, allow the world, we need to, you know, s stop the, the uh, output of carbon emissions and stuff. And the world, they say the world is perfectly designed to heal itself before we give it time. I say, oh, it's designed, is it? Now these are evolutionists that are telling me it's designed. They slip every now and then. They say, Mother Nature. Because they figure you've got to give it a personality because it's so clear to them that there, there's some intelligence in it. So then you've got a flood of fossil evidence. Um, and I use that word flood of fossil evidence deliberately. Um, the Bible says, and I, I don't know who's going to get to talk about Noah and the flood, and this may come up again later, but just talking about Genesis in general and creation. The Bible says that there was a time when the world was extremely lush. And because of sin, there was a global catastrophe called the flood. And in that catastrophe, all of the beauty and the lush vegetation was covered to a great extent. When Noah gets off the ark, he's got to send out some birds to find out if anything's alive. They stay on the bird until they get a single olive leaf. And that was a good sign that something had survived. Well, you know, most of you came to prayer meeting tonight driven by the world that lived before the flood. Any of you remember Sinclair gas stations? What was, yeah, it's a dinosaur. They had it right. That, that all of the oil and the coal, it comes from a primeval world that was extremely lush. We know. You see the, f the fossils of ferns that are 20 feet high, and you've got a dragonfly with a two-foot wingspan. Can you imagine when that scare you half to death? <laughs> Unless you were a lot bigger, too. But everything was bigger. Everything was lush, and it was covered in a catastrophe, and there's enormous... You know how much oil and coal there is? We're using it every day for energy. Enormous reserves. I mean, th there was a world that was completely covered in veg, and it was global because they find woolly mammoths up in Siberia that die suddenly, and they're chewing on ferns. And they find it in all different climates. Uh, things have changed. So the fossil evidence supports that. And then you've got uh, what you call living fossils. I can give you several examples, but uh, do you know, you, you find, I'm um, oh, sorry, I couldn't hear you, Walt. Don't look over this way. When I say fossil evidence, I'm sorry, no, I, I wasn't looking over there. <laughs> I could look in a mirror and see enough fossil evidence. Um, I remember when I lived on the East Coast, we'd see the horseshoe crabs would come up at certain times on the beach, and boy, they are, they are gnarly, scary-looking creatures. Uh, they look alien. Any of you ever been there and seen the horseshoe crabs? Uh, they find fossils of horseshoe crabs and they say, what an amazing thing. The horseshoe crab has not shown any change in 50 million years. Now why would the horseshoe crab be the same today 50 million years later? And all these other creatures, they say, uh, you know, they died off millions of years ago and have been replaced so many times. The sharks. Look at these megalodon sharks and the crocodiles. They find fossils that are almost identical. That are, they predate the dinosaurs. And then they have what they call some of these living fossils. For years they had these fossils of something called a coelacanth. And um, it's a really strange. They said it was one of the missing links because it's got these stubby fins that look like, you know, they could walk along the seafloor on them. And they said, yeah, these coelacanths, they slowly, they walked out of the ocean and they turned into legs and then we later find out that the coelacanth actually is um, still alive today. They fish them out of the Indian Ocean. They live in very deep waters. And when you bring them to the surface, they die because they're used to such incredible pressures that they can't live up higher. And uh, so the idea that they walked out on land is absurd. They walk upon the bottom of a very deep sea. They said they were, you know, how did they manage to survive unchanged for 40 million years? Um, so, but they were saying they're extinct. There's a lot of misinformation. And if you look at how they date fossils, you know how they date, it's called circular reasoning. How do they get a date for 
fossils and layers. Um, when you say, how do we date this layer of earth? They say, well, we study the fossils. See what fossils are in that layer of earth, and then we tell how old that layer of strata is. Okay, well, how do you date the strata based on the fossils we find? Are you with me? So you say, well, well you're, you're dating the strata on the fossils, and you're dating the fossils on the strata, so how do you know you're not wrong about both? The answer is they don't really know. And then they do something called radioisotope carbon-14 dating, which is based on what you call, don't miss this, an assumption, an assumption that the amount of radiation escaping a living object is going to be constant. And so what they do is they, they measure, and there's, you know, you, within a couple thousand years you might be able to use that science, but then it starts getting really squirrely after that. And they, it's very unpredictable. They also find that things can affect it. If you take like a dog bone and you buried it 200 years ago and you take another dog bone from the same dog, a different part of his body, and you put it in a sodium solution and then you have them both sent to a dating lab, they're going to have one dating millions of years different from the other. So if things are immersed in a sodium solution for a year, it can change the dating. Well, wasn't the whole world immersed at one point? Wouldn't that grossly change the dating? And I, I've used this illustration before. I know I'm taking a lot of time on this, but I'm just trying to, I know there's people listening. Uh, once you can get past the evolution and you realize that there's a living God, um, you walk into a room and there's a candle burning on a table. And someone says, how long is that candle be burning? Well, you do a little analysis and you say, well, I'm going to measure. I'll use my watch and see how quickly it burns down. And I'll see how much wax is puddled at the bottom. Try and figure out how much wax it consumes. Maybe I can get a calculation and figure out how tall it was to start it. Okay? How do you know how fast it's burning? Well, I measured it. But when you open the door, you let more oxygen in. How fast was it burning before you came in the room? Well, I'm not quite sure. It would burn maybe slower if there was less oxygen. There's so many things that could be different that would affect that. The environment of the world, according to the Bible, was extremely different before the flood. It says it never even rained. It had a uniform temperature around the planet. That, that there was some kind of envelope of water that was polarizing the rays of the sun and giving them a, an even temperature around the world. Man didn't need artificial protection from the environment. I mean, you just think how different things were, how big the fauna was, and you say, it's reckless to say, I can measure certain things today and it probably has been constant. And so the dating methods is the, is the weak link in the whole theory of evolution. They don't know. The only thing they can do is guess that it's always been the same. Um, and a lot of those guesses, they say, oh yeah, volcanoes, you know, they'll, they'll measure certain volcanoes and say, yeah, 50 million years ago. And then they'll see a volcano that forms in 20 years in Iceland. They'll measure some of the lava there. They say they can date rocks, you know. And they've watched this volcano develop and it'll register that it's 10 million years old. Well, they watched it in 20 years come out of the ocean. So it's very unreliable dating methods, but they don't, they don't like to um, advertise that. Another thing is, oh, well, we got layers of snow. And, you know, we can, we can look at the layers. We count the layers of snow in the Arctic regions, and we realize that, you know, there's been an ice age of 200,000 years. Well, that's been disproved <laughs> a number of times through uh, history. I don't know if any of you ever heard of, they had um, a number of planes that crashed uh, one of them was recovered called the Glacier Girl, P-38s during World War II. Five of them had to make an emergency landing. They got caught in the storm, ran out of fuel. Thankfully, all of the pilots were rescued, but they had to leave the planes. There was no way to take off from where they landed. They got covered with snow. Some aviation mil millionaires that were just buffs that wanted thought that, oh man, here they were, brand new P-38s being delivered to Europe. If I could get one of them, if we could find them. They looked for years and failed. Finally, they realized that they had been shifting and they found them, dug down 200 feet and found them. And if they measured the layers of snow, those things landed, you know, 150,000 years ago. <laughs> and then some people observed, they said, no, the layers are not caused, they don't all represent a year. Each one of those layers of snow represents a storm. And you could have 100 storms, blizzards, in one year in the Arctic region. 
And so, I mean, there's just been a lot of very dubious science. And one guy writes a report story on it. The other guy says, well, Dr. So-and-so wrote this. And you'd be surprised people didn't get a PhD. <laughs> and because he's got PhD, they say, well, this doctor wrote it. And I, I respect education. But uh, some of them have been proven wrong. So, um, now, wha before we leave the subject of evolution, and I'm almost out of time here, we'll have prayer. Evolution is not a dirty word for Christians. Things do evolve. Societies evolve. Food evolves. Transportation evolves. You know, we're not on horses anymore. So the word evolution happens. There is something that we observe called microevolution. Microevolution, not macroevolution. Macroevolution is where a monkey becomes a man. There's no evidence of that. Microevolution is where a wolf eventually turns into a chihuahua. Actually, that almost looks like macroevolution, but it's microevolution. But uh, all dogs in the world come from dogs. They're all related. I, I've even got a National Geographic. I took a picture of it. And they said that we've done DNA tests, and we're confident now that every dog in the world, regardless of how different the species are, all evolved from two original wolf-like dogs. I think that's right. I even saw another Newsweek article that said, we've done DNA research and we believe that all the humans in the world are related and they came from two original humans. And the, the article was titled, The First Eve. Uh, so, and this was not written by a Christian. Um, you do find evolution within species. The Arctic rabbit is white, the desert rabbit is brown. God has pre-wired in a miraculous way within different species the ability to adapt and evolve to survive in varying environments. And there are different features that will be more prominent. You know, if you want a, an animal that's going to go down a hole and catch a rat, then you breed a dachshund. You don't breed a Great Dane to go down a hole. And it's bred for something else. It's bred to eat a lot of dog food, as far as I know. So, uh, you do have microevolution, and uh, so, but you and so they say, look, we've seen Darwin came back from the uh, Galapagos, and he showed all these cases of microevolution. Look at the finch. There's all these different finches. They've evolved this different ability. I don't argue. Look at the cormorants. The cormorants don't fly here because they don't need to. They all swim. Fine. Uh, you've got penguin-like creatures in the north that fly, and in the south, southern hemisphere, they don't. They swim. They may all be related. That's called microevolution. But you know what? They're all penguins. They're all cormorants. They're all dogs. They're all cats. That's how Noah was able to fit two on the ark of each species, of each kind. Noah did not need to take on the ark a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and a Maltese and a Yorkie and a Beagle and... He just needed two dogs, right? And so, because they see evolution within species, microevolution, they think that that means that you have evolution, macroevolution. It doesn't exist. There's no example of it anywhere in science. So, in the beginning, God created all things, the heaven and the earth. I haven't even got to the heavens yet. Oh, someone said, Pastor Doug, we know that the universe has been here for thousands of years because how else could you get the light it's taken millions of years for the light to reach some of these stars, from these stars to the earth. Uh, when God made the first trees, did those trees have rings in them? Could have. Why not? When God made Adam, did Adam have to learn to walk or did he know how to walk like you buy you know, a computer from the factory with certain pre-installed software? Did Adam know how to talk? Did Adam have a belly button? No, probably not. <laughs> Nor Eve, for that matter. <laughs> I had to think for a second. <laughs> she was born of Adam, but I doubt she had a belly button. It, it was different. <laughs> um, so, um, the light from the stars. Can God create something already in process? So when God creates the heaven and the earth, can He create light already in route? Sure. So the idea that you have to have these things, uh, that, that means there's a long time. God can create the world with a certain amount of time built into it. 
so that you could start enjoying the stars. God's going to say, oh, look, I'll create it with the light already en route so you see it. Otherwise, man would have to wait all million years to see the first stars. They underestimate the power of God. So you can believe God spoke and it came into existence. So I guess you could say, I believe in the Big Bang. God said it, bang, it happened. <laughs> you know, that's a bumper sticker, but it's cute. 